just like what you see here. And we'll have roots. We won't really have a lot of sawdust. There may be a little bit thrown in to retain a, a bit of moisture during shipping, but they won't be packaged like what you see here. Um, the plants, when they come bare root, are usually dormant, where if you purchase containerized or prepackaged plants, they're usually coming out of dormancy. So they have leaves that are starting to grow and buds that are starting to push. Um, it's important that when you purchase bare root that they come dormant because we don't want the roots to need and the plants to need a lot of moisture because we're shipping them in this in this container in this um, box that doesn't have moisture available for them. Um, we usually will get bare root from online sources. So if you order from somebody like David Austin, um, it will typically come bare root. And we need to keep those roots moist. So we need to make sure that we are on top of our game. When this package arrives at our house, we're gonna open it right up. We're gonna fill up a bucket with water like what you see here. And we're going to soak the plants before we plant them. And we're gonna have to get them in the ground fairly quickly. Um, we wanna keep them cool. We don't wanna put them out in the sun because we don't want them to dry out and become stressed. Um, but you can soak them for up to 24 hours before planting. I often get plant, um, get asked when is the best time to plant a rose and you can plant a rose pretty much any time, but there are some times that are better for planting. So spring is probably the best time to plant as soon as the ground is workable. So that's usually around mid-March for us. The ground is thawing out. We can get um, you know, a shovel down into the ground and the ground is also starting to dry down. So it's, it's easy to work. So spring is a great time. We also have a lot of available moisture in the soil and our air temperatures are not too hot. It is a little more difficult to plant in the summer and I would recommend not planting any kind of bare root or packaged um, type of rows in the summer. Instead, I would stick to containerized plants. So if I was having to plant um, in the summer, I would go down to my local nursery. I would pick up what I need from them um, in containers with soil and get that down in the ground. Um, just the intense heat that we have here in Utah in the summer and the lack of water that we have available to a lot of our plants will make it really difficult for our roses to establish, especially if they're bare roots. So we don't want to plant bare root in the summer. And in the fall is a great time to plant. Um, fall is very underutilized as far as planting goes. So um, you can often pick up plants at a discount at your nurseries in the fall. So it can save you a little bit of money. Uh, now understand that we're not gonna put on as much root system if we plant in the fall as if we planted in the spring. So one of the things we may have to do to protect our roses from extreme cold temperatures is to mound up a little bit of mulch around the base of the plant um, to protect that plant over the first winter. And then when spring comes, we're gonna go out, we're gonna pull the mulch back away from the plant so that it can breathe and exchange gases on all of the surfaces of the plant above ground and make sure that the plant is living and moving and everything is, is looking like it's going to be growing well. When we plant, we want to make sure that we get that spacing correct. So you can see these are not necessarily roses, but you can see that these plants are spaced um, really quite far apart. And it looks, it looks so goofy when you start to lay out the garden when you're thinking about appropriate spacing because you are really considering the mature size of these plants. You know that this, this plant is gonna get three feet across, but it looks so lonely right now. So you have to resist that urge to put things closer together and space things appropriately. So polyanthas are typically um, spaced a little bit closer and that is because they're often used as hedges. So you can space those one to one and a half feet apart. Grandifloras are larger. They're like the hybrid tea roses. Now remember, um, polyanthas are also floribundas. They're the same type of, of rose. Um, the grandifloras are a hybrid between the, the polyanthas or floribundas and the hybrid tea. So it takes on the full size of the hybrid tea. So these two, the grandiflora and hybrid tea need to be about three to five feet apart. And you're gonna wanna check your tags on your plants when you purchase and make sure you're doing this correctly. Shrub roses, depending on the final size of that shrub rose, it's usually about two to four feet. It can be a little bit more if you are planting a very large rose. And then climbing roses need quite a bit of space between them because they will climb and they will spread. So they say about six to 10 feet between the different plants. Once we get them planted and placed into the ground, we are going to have to give them 
water. Um, this is something that we're going to have to watch very carefully, especially as the rose starts to establish. Roses are not a drought tolerant selection. They need quite a bit of water, especially when they're getting established. So um, we're not going to be able to really take down the water on these. Now our water schedule is going to depend on a couple of different factors. The first is our soil type. So remember I talked about clay soils holding water and sandy soils, um, the water runs through very quickly. So depending on your soil type and how well your soil holds water, um, will de we'll determine how often you need to irrigate. Um, and you can get a soil test done. It's very simple to do. You can go to the USU Analytical Lab site. I believe I have a, um, a website here in a couple slides that I can show you, but it's USUAL, so usual.usu.edu. And you can um, send in a soil sample and they will come back and tell you what your soil type is. They'll also tell you some different things about your soil, like your pH, your salinity, um, how much phosphorus and potassium you have, and your organic matter content in the soil. So it's a good thing to do about once a year, once every other year, it's, um, it's a good thing to do. Um, your water schedule is also going to depend on the temperature. So the hotter it gets outside, that air temperature, the more water the plant has to have to cool itself. So plants use water to cool themselves. They pull the water up through the roots, move it up through the plant. They open little pores on the leaves called stomata, and they release that water. And as they release the water into the atmosphere, they're also releasing heat along with the water. So that is how plants cool themselves. So the hotter it gets, the more water we're also going to need for these. Wind can desiccate and dry things down very quickly. So if we have a windy day and you're just trying to get your roses established or you notice that they're kind of droopy after the wind, you might need to go and check the soil and see if you need a little bit of water. And your microclimate again, what your yard is like, how that heat radiates, how the sun hits your yard, how much time this plant spends in the sun, this all factors into how often you're going to be irrigating. It kind of boils down to in the spring, you're going to be watering about twice a week, depending on the weather outside and the air temperature. Um, same thing goes for our lawns. We don't water our lawns until it's time to water the lawns, until we get some heat and we don't have available water in the soil. The same kind of thing with our roses. In the summer, as things heat up, we're going to be watering about three times a week, not anymore. We want to water deep, so this is important. If we can get the water down deep into the soil, as the rose is established, it's going to put down um, roots down into the soil between two and three feet deep. And if we can get the water down deep into the soil, the rose will have ample water to pull from the soil. Now you can containerize roses and you can plant them in these containers. Um, you will have to water more frequently if you're going to be planting in containers. And when we water more frequently, we also wash out nutrition out of the soil. So you're probably going to have to fertilize your roses a bit more in a container than you would in the ground. So fertilization, since we're on that topic, let's talk about it. Roses are a flowering plant. That means that they need some different types of fertility to produce a flower. It's not just nitrogen. Um, so when you look at a bag of fertilizer, there are three numbers across the front of the bag of fertilizer. The first one is nitrogen, the second one is phosphorus, and the third one is potassium. A flowering plant needs phosphorus, and it needs potassium. So it needs those two last numbers. It needs a little bit of nitrogen. Nitrogen is what tells our plant to produce green growth. It tells the plant to produce leaves and it tells the plant to get tall and produce stems. Um, phosphorus is a little bit different. This is what tells the plant you have enough, um, you have enough resources to flower. So that phosphorus is key for creating flowers. And then potassium kind of supports the all around growth and it also supports the root system of the plant. So phosphorus does play a little bit of a role in the flowering. So our roses need what's called a complete fertilizer. So we will have three numbers and all three of those numbers will have a number in it. It won't be like 2100, it will be something like 161616. 16, 16. So um, phosphorus and potassium are often present in our soils already. You may not need to add it. And this is where that soil test again comes in handy. And here is that website that I was telling you about. If you go to USUAL, 
www.usu.edu. You can get a soil test done and we can tell you what your phosphorus and your potassium is in the soil. Phosphorus and potassium stick around in the soil. They don't wash out. Nitrogen does wash out. So um, we often need to add more nitrogen, but if you have ample amounts of phosphorus and potassium in your soil, you may not need to add any for quite some time. We wait until the plants use it up a bit before we add. Um, you can use what's called a slow release fertilizer. So that means that it's going to release these macronutrients is what we call them, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium over a long period of time. Um, so you can use a, that slow release fertilizer once a season, spring, summer, and fall. And you want to use something like what I mentioned before, a 16, 16, 16, if your phosphorus and potassium are low, or if you have adequate phosphorus and potassium, you can just add a little bit of nitrogen a couple times a year. So that 2100 is kind of what you'll look for in the nursery. Mulch is a wonderful thing to add to your rose plantings. Um, it can benefit your roses in a number of ways. The first way is that it can reduce weed pressure. And I look at this picture and I kind of cringe because I can see Bermuda grass coming up through the mulch. <laughs> and Bermuda grass, if you don't know, is a noxious weed um, and you don't want that in your flower beds. But the great thing about mulch is it can help suppress some of that weed growth. Um, and it can help to retain some of the moisture in the soil as well, because we don't have this soil that's open and exposed to the air. So we're not gonna lose quite as much moisture, especially in the heat. Um, it also adds a nice organic matter. So um, as these wood chips break down, they're going to incorporate into the soil and it will add organic matter into that soil. And it can improve our soil drainage and tilth. So that organic matter um, is what kind of helps to open up pore spaces. So if you have really heavy clay soils, adding something like a wood mulch on the top of your soil and allowing it to break down will eventually help to improve the drainage in your soil. And the tilth is kind of the overall texture of your soil. Um, David, I saw someone raising their hand. Did we need to ask a question? Um, we had, they haven't typed in a question. Okay. And so I guess we could tell them if you've, if you've used the raised hand button, please use the Q&A box and we can answer that question for you. Okay, I just wanna make sure that they get their question answered. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, roses are subject to a number of problems too. I mean, they're this beautiful, gorgeous princess in our gardens, but they're also the prima donna that is fussy and needs some extra care sometimes. So you may run into some of these problems that I'm going to discuss tonight, and that's okay. These are common things, um, easy to run into, easy to treat for the most part as well. So as far as insects go, some of the more common things that you may run into are things like aphids, mites, thrips, and leaf cutter bees. Um, as far as diseases go, there are a couple that are kind of predominant in Utah. We run into powdery mildew, we see some crown gall here and there, rose mosaic virus, and some of the nutrient deficiencies that happen because of the way our soil is, and I'll explain that as we get going here. So let's talk about aphids. Um, you walk out to your rose garden and you see this. This is really, really common. Aphids are an insect that are a soft bodied insect. So if you walked up to this and you put your thumb on it, you would squish them so easily and your thumb would be totally green and pink. Um, they don't have that hard body armor that a lot of our other insects have. And they have what's called piercing sucking mouth parts. So they have this mouth that's like a straw it pierces into the plant tissues and it sucks out the plant sap. And that is what the aphids live on. Aphids can reproduce very, very quickly. So you can walk out you know, one day and not see many and you walk out a week later and your plants are covered. And that is because they can clone themselves. So they don't even have to reproduce. They can give birth to live young by cloning themselves. So the problem can come on very quickly. There are some great ways to control this without using chemicals. Um, the first way to control it is by rinsing the plant off with a pretty strong stream of water. These guys don't grip onto the plant very well and they have a hard time climbing back up the plant. So if you can take your hose and just spray them off with a really forceful stream of water, they'll drop to the ground and you won't have near the amount of insects on your plant. And you may have to do this every day 
for a week or two weeks until you can get the aphids kind of under control. Now you can up your game, you can level up and you can add dish soap to the water, something like Dawn. And you can put it in a sprayer and you can spray down the insects. Um, the, dis the dish soap breaks down the outside layer of the aphid and kind of desiccates the aphid. So um, they don't survive when they've been hit with dish soap. Uh, one of the things that they really, really are attracted to are plants with a lot of lush, green, tender growth. So that's why they're out here on the end of the stem. This is where it is the most tender, where it's easiest for them to get those piercing, sucking mouth parts to go into the plant. So that's where you will find them is on these ends. So um, fertilization can cause a lot, like over fertilizing with a lot of nitrogen can cause um, a lot of that lush, tender green growth. So if we avoid over over fertilizing and we're careful with our fertility, we can avoid some of the problems that we see with insects like aphids. Now, occasionally we have to resort to a chemical control, but I tell people to please try everything else first. This is what's called integrated pest management. We don't want to be putting a lot of chemicals out into our environment because it doesn't just hurt the aphids, it also hurts our beneficial insects. There are ladybugs that are likely here eating the aphids and we don't want to, we don't want to affect the ladybugs, we just want to affect the aphids. So, when, when we get to a point where we can no longer control with some of these other methods, we can then look at a chemical control. And we're going to use this very, very carefully. Um, you can use a systemic chemical. Usually the active ingredient in most products that control aphids on roses, um, the active ingredient is imidacloprid. Um, Bare Rose and Flower Care is one that you can pick up at Home Depot or Lowe's, any of the home centers. Most of the nurseries will have that one readily available. And you spray it on the rose. It is long lasting and it is what's called a systemic. So it goes into the rose and it's in the sap. And as the aphids pierce and try and suck out the sap, um, it will kill the aphids. So that's how that one works. We can also utilize biocontrol methods. And this is where we're gonna support predatory insects. So we're going to support ladybugs or lady beetles in the garden, or we're going to support lacewings in the garden because they're both excellent predators of aphids. And you can actually pick up um, lady beetles at many, many nurseries and you can release them out into the garden. A lot of the times if there's a food source and there's water, they will stick around. So what I do when I release lady beetles is I will water and I will spray down the foliage of the plant. Um, and then I will release the lady beetles and I do this at night because they're not going to fly at night. So they stick around, they crawl over the plants, they find the food source and they find the water and they tend to stick around a lot better. Mites are another insect that we run across and it's not even actually an insect, it's an arachnid. If we look at this little guy up here, he has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight legs. So he is an arachnid. Um, they also work on these plants by piercing and sucking. So they have the same type of mouth parts that an aphid has. What we see on the plant is stippling and you can see that on this leaf down here and it looks like somebody has taken and just punched little holes all over the plant and it, it kind of looks polka dotted. Uh, just little tiny stippling. If you ever did a, an art project in junior high or high school and you had to stipple, you just took a pen and you made little tiny dots and the how many dots you made determined how dark it was on your piece of paper. It's the same kind of thing with it with the mites, they will stipple. We'll also see webbing in between leaves and stems. You can see that up here and the mites will move back and forth. Remember I said they're an arachnid, so they actually spin webs. And you can see these little dots moving back and forth that are the mites. Um, they love hot, dry, dusty conditions. So this is kind of key to understanding why we have mites on our plants sometimes. If we are in a place where there's a lot of dust, there's been construction or there's a dirt road, we often see a big uptick in mites. Um, there are a lot of cultural controls that you can do. Again, things like the strong stream of water, adding soapy water will help also the same as aphids. Um, you can use some broad spectrum um, insecticides, but I don't recommend those. A lot of the time with mites, we see um, what's called, it's almost like a bounce back. So we will hit these, um, these mites with an insecticide and 
they'll go away for it for just a little bit, but then they rebound in just massive numbers. And then we've got a real problem on our hands because there are mites that are predatory that actually come along and eat this two spotted spider mite that you see here that causes our problem. And those predatory mites are knocked out by the insecticides as well. So then we don't have the biocontrol available. Um, so I use chemicals with mites as a very, very, very last resort. Thrips are another insect that you will probably run across if you're having roses in your garden. Um, I have a grower in Davis County that grows um, beautiful cut flowers. And she brought in a bunch of buds that looked like this about two years ago into my office. And she had a thrip problem. So they, they actually damage the buds when the buds are just forming. Again, it's a piercing sucking insect. So they have those same mouth parts again. And most of the damage that they do is cosmetic. They can transmit some viruses back and forth as they pierce and they suck on different plants. Um, but this for her was a very big problem because she was actually growing the roses to cut and sell. And so it was a huge issue for her. So we had to get the thrips under control. Cultural controls, again, don't over fertilize. Thrips are very attracted, just like the aphids are to that young tender growth. They can be difficult to control, they fly. And um, so they're never really in the same place twice. So um, they can be a little bit um, more of a challenge. So we do tend to um, turn to chemical controls a little bit um, sooner with the thrips than we do with some of the other insects. So again, imidacloprid is one of the, the very common and effective chemicals and it's a systemic and it works well against these. Um, again, supporting beneficial insects, these predatory insects, lace wings, um, assassin bugs, all of these type of types of insects will actually come and eat and actively hunt some of these insects and will help give us some control. The other one is leaf cutter bees. Um, now this one is more of a cosmetic problem and I usually get three or four phone calls every year about these circles that are missing out of the leaves of someone's roses. And it's almost like crop circles. It's this big mystery and everybody's always really, really concerned about it. But you can see these circles, they're just cut. And a lot of the times they look like perfect circles. Like somebody took a paper punch and took holes right out of the, the edges of the leaves. These leaf cutter bees will use the leaves to stuff empty cavities like what you see here with the, the circles that they cut out and they will actually lay eggs in succession inside and make these little individual nests all the way down this, this large tunnel. Um, so these guys are actually beneficial. So we don't wanna take out the leaf cutter bees. They're a wonderful resource for us to have. They do help with some pollination and um, so we, I typically don't tell people to treat for this, but if you do see these circles cut out on your roses, at least you know what it is. So let's move, oh, go right ahead. There's a question about uh, kind of a pest related. It's yeah. the question is, I always get water beetles in my garden. Are they friend or foe? So water beetles, are they meaning the big toe biter water beetles? I'm not quite sure. Shelby, uh, do a quick follow up comment on that. Yeah, let us know. Um, and, then, and then Melanie raised her hand again. Melanie, if you will type your question in the Q&A box, we can get to that question. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, give us a follow up. I'd love to know if it's the big, the big water beetles that have the two big eyes and kind of the claws almost. <laughs> They're a little scary looking. Okay, so let's move on to some of the pathogens that we can run into. So powdery mildew is one that is really, really common. This is a fungal infection, and you can see it here on this rose. You see this white powder all over the rose. Um, a lot of the times there's not a lot that you can do to prevent it, especially if we have long, cool, wet springs. So two years ago, we had a very prolonged, cool, wet spring, and I saw powdery mildew everywhere. Um, it also pops up where we have poor air circulation. Um, and you'll see, sometimes it will start with just these little circular spots. So you can see the circular spots on these leaves down here. Um, and these circular spots are where the infection starts. And once it really gets going, it will cover the entire rows. So cultural controls are very important here. This will overwinter in any leaves that drop around the plant. 
and then we'll reinfect the plant the next spring. So we've got to clean up in the fall. We've got to make sure that we're not leaving um, diseased plant tissues out in the garden. If we can water without wetting the leaves, so drip irrigation, and I know Weber Basin loves drip irrigation because it saves so much water. Um, if you can water from the base of the plant with some kind of drip, then that is the best way to water your roses. Now, I know that that's not possible for everybody without completely revamping your sprinkler um, system. So um, watering in the morning is also a wonderful thing to do because it gives the leaves a chance to dry down very quickly in the daytime instead of watering at night where the leaves stay wet all night long. So that is also another option. We can use some chemical controls, so fungicides, things like sulfur. Um, we do have to watch the temperature on sulfur because it can burn our plants, so make sure you read the label, and copper as well. Crown gall is actually a bacterial infection, and it lives in the soil. Um, Agrobacterium tumefaciens is the name of this bacterium. It does need a wound to enter the plant, so if you cultivate around the plants and then you start to see these odd gall-like growths down around the base of the plant. It's likely when you cultivated um, that you, you nicked the roots and this pathogen was available in the soil and entered into the plant that way. So we usually see the galls forming at the base of the plant. They can form higher up. Um, it's usually more of a cosmetic problem, but eventually over time, it will weaken the plant and will kill the plant. So if you see this, you wanna remove and destroy this. Um, and you're not going to be able to replant a rose in the same spot. Um, you're gonna to have to replant somewhere else because because that bacterium is there, it's active, it's in the soil, and if you nick the, just a, the tiniest little nick on, on the root system planting a new plant, you can very easily infect a new plant. Mosaic virus is another one that I see a lot, um, and this is transmitted by the insects that we talked about, so aphids and thrips and spider mites all can move this virus from plant to plant. It can also be moved from plant to plant by gardening tools. So if I come in and I see a, a leaf like this and I cut it with my pruners and I don't clean my pruners and I move to the next plant, I can very easily infect my next plant. Um, oh, that should say it requires a living host. I'm sorry, not a living hose. I, I hope we don't have any living hoses out there. That should say requires a living host. So it has to, it can't just live out in the environment. The virus can't. It has to have an insect that it's living in or it has to have a plant that it's living in. It can't live on its own. But we'll see this modeling or mosaic pattern start to form on the leaves. And that's kind of the telltale sign as to what's going on. And it will eventually weaken the plant and it serves as a source for new infections for plants around it. Um, so there's no cure for viruses. So we have to completely remove the plant so that we're not spreading this out into the environment. The other problems that we run into are nutrient problems. And these usually have to do with our high pH soils that we have in Utah. So our soil is usually 7.5 to 8.5, somewhere around there. And as the soil gets higher on the pH scale, um, it makes it difficult for the plants to take up nutrients, things like iron. So this is an iron deficiency, and this is the symptom that we see. It's called intervenal chlorosis, and you'll see the leaves of the vein, or the on the leaves of the plant, the veins will be dark green, and then in between, we'll have chlorotic tissue, which means it's yellowed. And, um, and that is because the plant does not have iron. It can't pull iron up out of the ground because of the, um, the pH of the soil. This is also exacerbated by very wet soil. So if you're overwatering, you will likely see iron chlorosis start to happen. Nitrogen deficiency can also happen if you're not giving your plants a little boost of nitrogen every now and then. Um, and this happens on the old growth. So it will be at the base of the plant. You'll see the, the leaves starting to yellow. The growth will be kind of spindly and it just won't put on a lot of growth. You know, when we cut into our roses and we prune, we expect to see a lot of regrowth. If we're not seeing that regrowth, then we likely need to add a little bit of nitrogen to our plant. And then salinity. So um, we run across a lot of soils that have high salt in Utah, high salt content. And what we see on the leaves, instead of having this intervenal chlorosis, along the edges of the leaf, it will be burned. 
and it will be starting to die back. Um, so how we take care of that, and you should probably do a soil test at this point and make sure that that's the problem, but how we take care of that is we add extra water to the soil to move the salt down through the soil profile. It's the one time I tell people to overwater is when we need to move that um, salt down through and we only do it once or twice. All right, so let's talk about pruning. This is the part that really scares people about roses. They get a little bit nervous about pruning and it's not anything that you need to be nervous about. It's actually quite easy. So equipment that you will need, you're gonna need some gloves and you're gonna need heavy long sleeves. If you have a Levi jacket that you can put on, anything that you can put on to protect yourself, you're going to want to. Um, roses are not the most easy plant to work with, and that's because of those thorns. Um, you're also going to need some good, sharp hand pruners. And I say bypass pruners, and that means that we've got two blades that go past each other. There's another kind of pruner called an anvil pruner, and I do not recommend that. It does not give good clean cuts. So that's where that middle blade just comes and hits in the middle of a fat, wide blade underneath it, and it, the blades don't go past each other. So we wanna make sure we have bypass pruners. There are two seasons when we want to prune. Winter, when the plants are dormant, we can do this in February or March, usually around March in Utah, and summer. And the primary reasons why we would want to prune is we want to stimulate new spring growth. So that's when we will dormant prune. So right around now, or we will want to remove any of the spent flowers. And that's when our summer pruning comes into play. So we want to prune in the winter. If we're going to do dormant pruning, we want to do it before the buds begin to swell. We want to prune in February and March. There are some kind of rules that we follow. So think about these, these next rules. I refer to them as the three Ds. So we want to remove any dead wood, anything that has died back, we want to get rid of out of the rose. Anything that's diseased or damaged. So this is my, my climbing rose at home. I pruned it for this class so that we could get some good pictures for you to see. And it had split over the winter. So this, this big cane actually ended up having to come out. So any diseased or damaged wood that we can see, we're going to also remove. And then um, I have a colleague named JD and he calls the next D the dumb, the dumb wood um, or the dumb canes. These are things that don't make sense or that just shouldn't be there. Things that are rubbing or crossing, things that hit you on the head or on the leg as you're trying to mow the lawn, anything that's in your way or doesn't make sense, we need to take out. And then we need to remove some of the oldest, upright, unproductive canes. The canes are only productive for a year or two. So we wanna make sure that we are constantly having new growth of good wood that will produce beautiful flowers for you in your garden. Kind of the rule of thumb is we're going to be removing about a third to a half of the previous season's growth on the canes. So when you look at your rose bush, you're, and this doesn't um, apply to climbers, but when you look at your rose bush, you're gonna look at it and you're gonna imagine it a third to a half shorter than what it is um, from the previous year. You will leave in general about five to 12 canes, depending on the size of your plant, and you're going to leave them anywhere from 18 to 24 inches tall. This is in general, we're gonna go through the varieties. Um, if you have any suckers, so roses are grafted, so we'll often have a root stock that controls the size of the rose, and then we'll have the scion, which controls the bloom of the rose. So um, we can get suckers that are coming from the root stock. So if you've got suckers coming up, they're going to bloom something totally different. They're going to be a different size. They're going to be really ugly. You're going to wonder what's going on. Any of those suckers that you see, you should prune off. And try to keep, as you prune, try to keep the center of the plant open. And this is gonna promote that good airflow and circulation. This is gonna reduce that incidence of powdery mildew in your garden. There are a couple of types of cuts that you're going to make. Um, there's a heading cut, and that's what you see here. This is where I'm gonna cut, but I'm gonna leave a stub. This is a heading cut. I'm always gonna cut above a bud eye. So this is where the bud is gonna come out. And you can see that here in this picture as well. We're gonna cut above that bud eye always. And we're going to try to slant the cut away from the bud. This is just something that rose gardeners do to keep the water moving and not sitting on top of a cut. We wanna make sure that that water drains away. It's more of an issue in humid climates than it is here in Utah because we are so arid, but it's a good practice to follow. Um, we just wanna give the rose the best opportunity to grow. Um, and if we can prevent 
fungal pathogens or diseases from entering the plant from sitting water, then that's what we should do. It also promotes good new growth from the remaining buds. So it will promote this growth um, to go in the proper direction as well. Now there are thinning cuts and this is what you would use to remove some of those suckers. We don't want this to come back. We don't want it to regrow. We don't want it to flower. So we're gonna cut those at the base. We're gonna completely remove that cane. Um, so anything that is diseased or unwanted like those suckers um, that we don't want to regrow, we're going to take all the way down to the base. So there are kind of 10 principles of rose pruning. The first one is to prune from the ground up. A lot of the times I'll see people kind of hover over the rows and they'll start from the top and they'll just make a million cuts and work their way down. It's much faster and much easier if you can get down at the base and look at the rows and figure out that 18 to 24 inches high that you wanna be or a half or a third of the rows, figure out your height and start cutting from the base. Um, just that pruning above waste time and the stuff up top is last year's history. We're not going to keep it. So we don't need to sort through it and we don't need to work through it. Our second rule is if it's too old to cut, we probably ought to cut it out. If it is old and it's been there for a long time and you can't get your pruners to cut it and you've got to go get loppers or a saw, it probably should have been cut out before. The newest canes are the greenest. So you can see in this picture how green and beautiful these canes are. They are our newest canes and they're going to be the most productive. They're going to give us the most bang for our buck. So remove the old growth with thinning cuts as low as possible if you need to, to get that old unproductive wood out of the middle of the rows. If it's in the way, get rid of it. Think about those three Ds, that dead um, or damaged or dumb. If it's in the way, if it whacks you when you take the lawnmower up next to it, get rid of it. Make it so it's not a problem. Number four is height as easy as one, two, three. You've got to remember that you're going to remove at least a third of the rows, and this is with the exception of climbers. I'm going to show you how to do climbers here in just a minute. Um, just remember, about a third is, your, is what you're going to take off to a half. Always try and cut to an outward facing bud, and this will give us good growth that faces outward and gives um, the rows some good structure. So remember those bud eyes, we're going to cut to a bud eye that's facing outward. We don't want it to face inward because then we're going to be promoting growth into the center of the plant and we're going to impede that airflow and it's not going to be conducive to a good, strong, healthy rose. When in doubt, cut it out. Roses are really hardy and they'll regrow. It's okay to cut something out. Um, a lot of the times we go to prune and we kind of get crippled. We kind of question ourselves and we say, you know what, I just really don't think I can cut this. But if you have doubts about it, it's okay to cut. It will regrow and it will totally forgive you. Um, there is a big debate about sealing rose cuts. In Utah, we don't need to do it. The only time that I would suggest that you seal is if we have an insect that's present in your yard that is boring, which means it's kind of eating its way down the canes. And then we would seal with something like Elmer's glue or just a plain old wood glue. But it is not something that we need to do in Utah typically. Um, when we seal pruning cuts, it often traps bacteria under the cuts and often tra traps moisture and we can create more problems than not in our environment. Number eight is we want to strip those leaves. We want to take off any leftover foliage from last year. So if your roses still have leaves on them, strip them away. Um, it can harbor pathogens. And then we're going to clean up. We're going to clean up everything that we've pruned. We're going to toss it. We're going to get rid of it. We don't want to invite pathogens and insects back into the garden. Um, so we don't want to have a lack of sanitation. And number 10 is my favorite rule. Don't sweat it. You're going to make mistakes. We all do when we prune and it's okay. Roses are tough. Remember I called them a princess, but underneath they're this gritty street fighting princess that can really handle um, what you throw at it. So as long as you leave a half to two thirds of the plant, it's going to regrow and it will regrow. And next year you can correct your mistakes. It's not that big of a deal. 
All right, so cultivar specific. We'll run through this really quick. So the hybrid tea and the grandiflora roses. So this is a rose in my backyard. It's a hybrid tea. Um, we're going to leave about five to eight canes more. We can leave more on older, well-established plants. We can have a larger plant. And we're gonna cut back to 18 to 24 inches high. And we're gonna cut back the new canes by a third to a half. So that is what I've done. I have removed some, you can see this little stub cut here um, that was as low as I could get it. Um, we've, re we've removed some of the oldest growth. We've left the new young growth and I've left it about 18 to 24 inches high. It's going to um, put out a bunch of new growth from these bud eyes that you can see here and there. And I'm going to have a beautiful rose again this year. Florabundas. Okay, this is the knockout rose at my house, and it is absolutely gorgeous. Now, these can be pruned to a hedge, and they do incredibly well when they're pruned to a hedge. So I have um, some hedging pruners like this, but they're battery operated, so I'm not, I'm not, you know, held back by a cord that's plugged into the house. It's just battery operated. I go out, and I cut back everything by a fourth. Um, and this is going to give me a beautiful hedge. It's going to push new growth. Wherever I make a cut, I'm going to get new growth pushed. And it's going to have a ton, just massive, gorgeous blooms all along the hedge. And they're long lasting and it reflowers. I usually get two or three flushes of blooms out of these gorgeous, gorgeous flowers. So Floribundas, really simple, really easy. Um, you can hedge them very, very nicely. All right, this is the climbing rose in my front yard. And you can see it's kind of a mess and we've got a lot of construction in my front yard. It's great fun. Um, but you can see I've got just this mass of canes here um, and it can be kind of difficult to sort through this. So what we're going to look for, we're gonna look for the main canes that come up and we're going to look at the side shoots that come off of it. The side shoots are where my new growth is going to be. And it's where I'm going to get flowers. I'm not going to get flowers on this main shoot. So this rose is only about, let's see, I think it's three years old. This rose is three years old. Um, so it's not very old at all. Um, I'm still working on getting the canes up to the top of the pergola and getting the structure formed. So I don't want to cut those main canes. I want to keep those growing. So I'm not going to head, I'm not going to tip them or heading cut them. I'm going to allow them to continue to grow this next year. So you can see what I've done. I've gone through and I've taken these laterals and I've just kind of given them a heading cut so that I can get new growth on the laterals that will provide me bloom and you can see these are the laterals that come out. These laterals are where I'm gonna have the bloom, but then I've got my main canes and structures going up to the top of the trellis and eventually it will go up and completely over the trellis. Um, you will get new canes forming and you kind of have to decide how many you want to keep. So I actually cut away a couple of the main um, canes because it was just too many for the size of the trellis that I had. So I, I selected four main canes to be my structure. So they're, they're, they're very thorny and they're hard to work through at first, but once you kind of get this down, it's really easy to do. So we kind of talked about this. Do I need to seal the cuts? No. Um, sealing cuts can promote the, can promote disease. Um, if we prune in the dormant season, so right now, the roses will have the opportunity to self-seal. So we don't need to worry about it. And the only time that we seal is when there are insect problems. Now, if we have to deadhead, which we often do um, in the summer, and this is with the hybrid teas and the floribundas, I don't normally do this um, with the hedge type roses. Um, or not the floribundas, the grandifolias. This is with the hybrid teas and the grandifolias. The floribundas are the ones that I hedge. So um, I will do this with the floor or with the grandifloras and the hybrid teas. I will go through and I can deadhead. And what you're going to do is you're going to cut back to where you have um, two five leaflet leaves. So you can see my beautiful rose here. It dies back. I'm going to find a place where I have two leaflets coming out with five leaf or two leaves with five leaflets and I'm going to cut just above that. You can see where the former cut is and where those two leaf um, those two leaves with the five leaflets were when I made my previous cut and then I get new growth that's going to give me some rebloom. Um, you want to slant those cuts if you can to keep the water from sitting on the top 
And it's as simple as that. So that is roses in a nutshell. Um, they're really not that daunting. Um, they're fun. I really encourage you to get some in your garden. Um, you know, I, I grew up not having, so my, my parents were big into landscape. Um, I come from a horticulture family um, and they were never into roses. And I have learned to love them as I have developed my own landscape and my own yards. And they're a wonderful addition. So um, I highly, highly recommend them. So um, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer any of those that you have at this time. Thank you, Sheridan. There's a, there are a couple questions about pruning and then back to that pest question. Okay. So there's a question about pruning different, or is there any difference on pruning carpet roses? Um, carpet roses, I'm not as familiar with carpet roses. I believe they're a low grower. Um, so there will be some differences. Um, you're probably not going to cut nearly as heavy into them, but probably the same kind of um, the same kind of deal where you're cutting back, you know, at least probably a third, I would say, of the plant to encourage regrowth because we don't get blooms if we don't encourage regrowth. So you are going to have to do some pruning and you're probably going to have to be a little more selective about it on a carpet rose. And then we have okay. another about growing. Can you grow a new rose bush from an old rose bush cutting? Yes. And if so, can you explain how? So yes, you can root them. You're gonna need what's called rooting hormone. And so you're gonna take some of the younger, ten, more tender growth. You don't want the really heavy woody growth. And you're going to take, and you're gonna cut that, you're gonna dip it in rooting hormone, and you're gonna to have to start them in containers um, in kind of a controlled environment. We've gotta keep that air temperature lower. So probably um, around 70 to 80 degrees on the air temperature. You wouldn't wanna be much higher than that. And um, you're gonna to have to watch the water very carefully, but you can root them. And after so much time, you know, you can pull them out of the soil and you'll see roots starting to form on them. It does take a while for them to form roots, um, but the rooting hormone speeds it up. And you're not gonna have the root stock to control some of the disease and the height and some of those characteristics. So what you will have is um, basically, like when we do, when we talk about fruit trees, um, we use rootstocks to control some of the same things. And if we don't have a rootstock, we call it a seedling tree. So we end up with much larger trees that are not disease resistant, that do have some issues, which is why we use rootstocks. So you may run into some of those problems. So I would do some research on um, your rows and see if um, it has been grafted, if it's typically grafted, what that variety is like um, when it's not grafted. Um, and see if it's something that you want to explore or if it's just easier to just grab another one at the, you know, at the nursery. It's kind of fun to do it yourself. And if you have a rose that's sentimental to you, like it belonged to somebody in your family, I can totally understand why you would want to do that. And then back to the water beetle question. Yeah. So a little expanding. She says they are, they are larger than a ladybug, of course, pure black, and they burrow into the ground. Okay, so she can send me a picture. Um, I can give you my email address and you're welcome to send me a picture of it. Um, there are so many insects that are black that burrow into the ground. I would need to see it. Um, so yeah, if she can send me that picture, that would really help me because there's not one that we call a water beetle that I'm familiar with other than the toe biter ones, which are really big. They're like an inch and a half long. Okay. Yeah. So Maybe that's, maybe that's a good time to give your email address yeah. now. So yeah. anybody that's still on, they can have your email and they can send you specific questions that they may have later. Yes, so it's Sheridan, S-H-E-R-I-D-E-N dot Hansen, H-A-N-S-E-N at USU dot E-D-U, like education. And I can, I can actually put it right here and that might make it easy for you to see, because my name is spelled a little bit different. And for everyone that's still on this, these slides will be posted on our website and the recording will be on there. I kind of messed up, so I didn't hit the record button until we were several minutes in, but the majority of it's there. So um, this will be on our website probably tomorrow. All right, so there, I typed my, I typed my email address right there so you guys can see how to spell it. It's a little bit different. 
So there, there are a few more questions. Hey. We've got, what roses would you recommend for containers? Okay, so you can do pretty much any rose in a container. Um, we've done the Floribundas in containers. They work really well. The miniature roses are excellent in containers. Um, the thing about containers is you're gonna have to watch the water so carefully. So make sure that you're watering. Um, you're gonna want to feel the, the soil. So put your hand down in there and feel how dry it is, um, especially when it's really hot outside. Um, and then you're going to have to control the nutrition a little bit more carefully. So um, because we do have to water more, that phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen washes out more quickly. So you're going to be using a slow release fertilizer a little more frequently. Um, and then you'll leave them outside in a protected area over the winter because we want them to go dormant. Um, and you're going to make sure that they have a little bit of moisture at the roots. So every now and then you grab a shovel full of snow and just you know, hit those containers to make sure that the roots aren't too dry and they're not getting desiccated over the winter. So, um, but any rose, you can really do that with. Okay, there's a couple questions about some miniature roses. Okay. One is, one is um, at the beginning of the class, you said miniature roses were similar to what type of rose, but I missed what type. Can you oh, please okay. elaborate? Yeah, so they're really similar to the hybrid tea roses. They're just tiny. Um, think about a big horse and then a little horse. Um, they're very, very much the same. Just one is a lot smaller. So when you prune miniature roses, again, all of the same principles apply. Um, you're going to be um, pruning back probably a little bit less. So I would say about a quarter because we have to promote some new growth, a quarter to a third of that plant. And, um, you know, they act just like the, um, the hybrid tea. So they'll have one long stem with usually one bloom per stem. And you'll cut them back after they bloom to that five leaflet area so that you can get regrowth and you can get new bloom. So yeah, and I just I just addressed how to prune miniature roses as well. So perfect. Well, you can, well, if you, you're seeing these questions, yeah. maybe I'll just let you read them off and answer yeah, them as you go. Fine. That's fine. I didn't know I could see them until just now. Um, so Deborah wants to know every summer, my, my roses start getting a brown, red, dry curling leaf edges and yellowing leaves. What causes this? So it could be a couple of things. Um, you could have a nutrient deficiency. So make sure you assess and look at um, where you're seeing this um, yellowing leaf kind of happen. If it's happening at the base with the oldest leaves, you may have a nitrogen deficiency. Um, if you have the iron chlorosis where you've got those dark green veins and the kind of yellow in between, you could have an iron deficiency, which would also cause dry curling leaf edges when it gets severe. So I would really assess it. Um, you can bring in um, samples to the Davis County Diagnostic Clinic and we can look at it for you as well. It could also be a watering issue. So watering, overwatering and, un and underwatering look a lot alike. So we'll see dried leaf edges. Um, we will see yellowing leaves as well. So you might want to assess how much water the, the roses are getting. It may be too much or it may be too little. So I would go out, I would dig a hole after I irrigate and I would see how wet that soil is. And then I would monitor to see how quickly it dries out. And you may, it may be something that you want to do um, a, a sprinkler audit on to kind of see if you're watering correctly in your yard. So it could be a couple of things. Um, the next one, Tracy says, can you plant a new rose where an old rose was after I used after I use Roundup and get rid of it? Yes, absolutely you can. As long as you didn't have a disease problem, um, something like um, the crown gall, you can definitely do that. So yeah, absolutely. Um, do we take a soil sample close to the base of the rose? Um, you can take them up around the roses. Um, so there are instructions on the soil sample. Um, so when you go to here, I'm going to type the I'm going to type the website in for you. So when you go to this website, the u the usual.usu.edu, and you pull up soil um, test, a home soil test. Um, it will give you a form with instructions and it will actually show you how to soil test. So you don't want to take it from just one spot, but you want to take it from several spots around that area. Um, 
so we would like to um, get kind of an overall picture of what's going on, not just a picture in one area. So you'll take a bunch of different samples, you'll mix it in a bucket, and you're going to send only two cups of soil up to the laboratory. And then they will tell you kind of the overall picture of what they see there. So you can go to that website and it will definitely tell you um, you know, all of the instructions that you need. Gregory wants to know, should you dormant spray roses? You can. If you've had problems with insects, things like aphids, um, some of these insects will um, put, um, they'll lay eggs and the eggs will overwinter. Um, sometimes they overwinter as insects kind of in nooks and crannies in, in the actual plant as well, like as, a, as adult insects. So yes, you can use a dormant spray on roses. Make sure that the buds are not open or swollen. So now would be a good time in March, as we're approaching March, it would be a great time to get a dormant spray on. I would use a lighter weight dormant oil. Um, I wouldn't use a really heavy oil. So as far as the weight goes, when you pick up um, your dormant spray, it will tell you different mixing instructions for different weights. And I would just go with a lighter weight because roses tend to be a little bit more tender. Pam says, I inherited a bushy rose that has millions of red roses on it, but it's in a crazy place. Can it be transplanted elsewhere? Yes, you can transplant roses. Um, you're gonna do it when the rose is dormant. So you're gonna cut it back, you're gonna prune it so that it's quite short. Um, so you're gonna really kind of hack into it. So instead of the one third, one half, you're gonna go more like the half. And then you're going to dig and you're gonna dig around it um, as wide as you can because we don't wanna damage the root system if we can help it. So we're gonna really work on getting a nice large root ball. You'll probably need a little bit of help and a wheelbarrow and lift it up and move it to a new location. So yes, um, now would be a great time to do that. Now, please understand that there's always a risk when you transplant that things sometimes go wrong um, or the rose could be too old or it just can shock. So know that sometimes when we do move things, even though everything we do is right, sometimes it doesn't go the way we want it to. Um, Pam, let's see, oh, no, we did Pam. Janice says, is there a way to rescue roses from a garden that was planned by a gardener with vision? It has been neglected by renters for a few years. I bought my house for the views and the garden, not for the house. Um, let's see, Janice, I'm wondering if, um, I'm wondering if you're talking more about like pruning roses that have been neglected or um, maybe you can give me a little bit of um, elaboration on that. I'll, I'll leave that one and we'll come back to that one in a minute. Um, I planted a rose last year and the leaves started turning black in the fall. I think it is a rugosa. I have black mulch, but none of my other roses have had that happen. Would it be the mulch or should I be concerned about a disease? So it can be a couple of things. Again, I would encourage you to bring a sample into the diagnostic clinic this summer. So the diagnostic clinic runs on Tuesdays and Thursdays from nine to noon at the USU Botanical Center in the education building. Um, and you can bring a sample in or you can email pictures. You can email pictures directly to me um, as well. Um, but um, sometimes it's hard to kind of tell what's going on without seeing pictures. So with mulch, if you've got too much mulch up around the plant, that can cause some problems and it could cause the rose to be dying back a little bit because the leaves have to exchange gases, but so do the roots. So we only want about an inch or two of mulch on top of the soil. So if you've got a lot of mulch mounded up around it, that could be an issue. Um, it could also be a disease. Um, it could also be that that plant is a little bit different. Um, you know, it could be the variety. There's a couple of different things that could happen. So um, bring in a sample and let's look at it this, you know, this summer or when the problem happens again. Um, when cutting roses for a vase, where's the best place on the stem to cut? So you want to cut long. Um, that's one of the things I do is I, I grow cut flowers here at the USU Botanical Center. So we want them long enough to go in the vase that you're going to be using. Um, but you want to cut above those leaves with the five leaflets on it. If you can cut back to a place that has those, that is the best place to cut because then we're going to get some regrowth. And you're going to just leave a little stub above those two um, leaves with the five leaflets on it. Any tips for pruning roses that um, were neglected, old roses that were neglected in recent years? Yep, so you're gonna just start pruning slowly. Um, so maybe not cutting into the rose quite as much, 
but you're going to take out about a third of the rows every single year. You're going to take out the oldest canes and start removing about a third of those every single year until you can kind of get the rows in check. And it may take you a couple of years um, to really get the rows in check. I wouldn't prune more than a third of the plant out. I'd be very carefully or very careful because we can shock the plant if we prune too heavy, especially in one that's been neglected. So slow and steady wins the race on that one. Um, is it bad to let the plants just grow wild? Is pruning really necessary? Well, it depends on what you're after. So you're going to get big, beautiful blooms if you prune the plant. Um, if you don't prune the plant, um, you're going to get much smaller bloom and the plant is going to get larger and larger and larger. And you'll just have bloom on the outside edges of the plant. You won't have um, bloom toward the inside and you um, will eventually shade out the inside and some of the canes on the inside will probably start to die. Um, pruning is a great practice. It takes out some of that old wood and gets rid of some of the disease potential that we have there, especially where roses are so um, finicky and, and subject to so many problems. It really is a good practice to prune. Um, should I prune my roses in the fall before winter? No, we want to wait until the plant is completely dormant. So um, we want to make sure that um, the plant has fully entered dormancy. And what happens with a plant when it enters dormancy is it um, takes all the nutrition back into the plant. And then it does some funky things with the cells to get ready for cold temperatures. And if we have if we prune the plant, pruning stimulates growth. So if we prune the plant, and even if the plant looks dormant, it may not be fully dormant. Um, but if we prune the plant before it's fully dormant um, and we stimulate new growth, sometimes the buds will actually start to swell in the fall and um, we can actually kill the plant that way. So we want to make sure that we don't do that. Um, so it's best to prune right around now, February to March is the best time for roses. We want to make sure that they have um, nice cool temperatures so those cuts can seal naturally and we're not going to accidentally stimulate new growth um, on the plant and break dormancy. Oh, Janice says I answered her question, so that's great. All right, any other questions? I think we're done then. Thank you everybody for coming and I so appreciate you um, being here for this. It was great fun to teach this class. So thanks um, David for the, the opportunity to do this. Thanks Sheridan, we appreciate it. There was there was one person that their hand raised but they never, oh. I never saw their question come in. So okay. if, if any visitors are still on there, send us an email, call us, we can answer the question if, if it still comes up. All right. So thanks Sheridan, appreciate it. Have a good night. You too, thanks everyone.